Good morning. <clears throat> you are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Excuse me, a little <clears throat> tickle in my throat this morning must be uh, the changing of the seasons. Um, so when we last met last week, um, we had uh, we had gotten um, the directive from the speaker that we should move forward with um, with a different structure, um, move forward with uh, the creation of a task force that can really um, slow down, take the time, listen to uh, members of the public, listen to uh, the employee groups, um, and uh, and and really, you know, want to just express that that you know we are listening. We we were listening when when you said you needed more time to to discuss this and analyze the challenges that are before us. And um, last week we had also seen a presentation from uh, Beth Pierce, the treasurer, and Tom Galanka, the chair of VPIC. They had worked together to put forward a, uh, some changes to the way um, the pensions are governed. Um, that uh, that proposal was given to us, you know, sort of in in word form, and we needed to share that with Ledge Council to uh, to have her draft it in bill form. Um, and so, we're going to take a look at um, what that first draft looks like of uh, of a governance change based on what was presented to us last week. And then we're also going to look at, um, you know, the possible makeup of a, of a task force um, that would be able to bring all parties together around the table to really figure out how we how we deal with all four buckets. And uh, for those following along at home and don't uh, don't immediately recall what the bucket analogy is, that is. We have state employees pension and retiree health care. We have teachers pension and uh, retired teachers health care. So those are the four buckets. Um, and those health care buckets, the OPEB buckets, really are, um, are, are, are an opportunity, but also a challenge because we have been um, sort of paying as we go when, you know, each year what we need for uh, for OPEB or retiree health care, uh, we're, we're paying it as we go. We have gotten a very strong recommendation from the treasurer and others to put that on a path for pre-funding, um, which means that you, uh, you, you amass what you think you're going to need going into the future and you start investing that so that part of that retiree health care gets paid for out of the investment proceeds. Um, it's a win-win for the state. Uh, and for the retirees, because um, it, it becomes a little bit cheaper for, uh, for the state because we're getting investment proceeds off of it. And it also is uh, better on our, uh, on our books as a state. Um, so that's sort of the snapshot of where we are now. And, and uh, as I said to the committee in an email yesterday, um, what we're going to look at this morning is just a, a, a first pass at setting up a task force and implementing the governance changes that were recommended to us um, last week. And we will uh, continue to work on this off and on throughout the week this week. Um, we won't be able to hear back from VPIC on their thoughts uh, as an official body to the proposal that their chair and the treasurer worked on until Friday because they're meeting um, uh, middle of the day on Friday. And we won't be able to hear from the treasurer either because she's, she's already stacked with a bunch of meetings this week. So uh, we're gonna take a look at the, um, the draft and, uh, and then have some committee discussion here this morning. And then what I'm hoping is that uh, we can do a little bit more work drilling down into some of the aspects of this draft that I think we can um, we can enrich by doing some uh, some uh, more investigating, uh, and then we'll let folks go do some of that homework uh, later this morning so that we can come back to a couple other bills after the floor today, and then um, it is my hope that anyone who's interested in 
uh, testifying on the proposal, we'll, uh, we'll contact our committee assistant, Andrea Hussey, and, uh, and get on our docket for tomorrow and Friday um, to begin uh, putting some refining touches on this. Any questions so far? I'm sorry, I've been rambling. I just wanted to make sure that folks who are watching along from the outside um, are oriented to where we are. Rob, did you want to ask a question? Oh, you got a... <laughs> Need you to unmute. I'm sorry. I said you read my mind, Madam Chair. I must have a tell. I mean, just is is there something on our website about in the bill form yes or is that not there is yeah i think andrea was putting it up um this oh, okay. morning, hot off the presses um because when i hopped on i didn't find it but i'll go back go uh go ahead and refresh i think it, i think you'll find it there hmm. Wednesday, April 7th. All right, it's under Becky, Rebecca Wasserman. Oh, okay, yeah, it wasn't there earlier. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. So any other questions from committee members before we go to Becky to walk us through the draft on our page? Excellent. And Rob, your tell is just that I can see when you're leaning in to hit the hit the raise hand or the unmute button. So not to worry. <laughs> you don't need to try to <laughs> disguise that. I like to I like to sometimes not wait for people to to raise their hand. You can tell when Mark's going to ask a question too cuz his hand gets right up here. <laughs> all right. Good morning, Becky. Thank you for being with us. Um and uh we all have the draft up on our secondary devices. Great. Um, good morning, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, I think I had, uh, I just want to check with Andrea that this is, I had sent another draft this morning mm. uh, uh, at a later date in the morning, and I just wanted to make sure that this was. This okay. says 5.06 p.m., draft 1.1. Um, okay. Um, I have a yep. different date on a time on mine, so I'm going to resend it if that's. Okay. Okay, just to um, excellent. Make sure while we're waiting for um, while we're waiting for Andrea to get that up on the committee page, we can just take a brief break. Um, So who has a crystal ball about how long floor debate will go this afternoon? Any Anybody think we're gonna get back to committee today? Rob? Absolutely, I predict it'll be 46 minutes and 38 seconds. Oh, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> hey, what's the over under on that? <laughs> Harrison have a pool going on it? You better give odds. So Mike Merwicki, I noticed that you've changed your mud season um, uh, virtual background back to the chamber. Does that mean mud season is over in your neighborhood? Uh, not quite, but <laughs> I, we're actually doing good. There's a, there's a main road that we access our house, and then there's a road behind us where there's about five houses, and they're still parking their cars at the end of the road walking in. Wow, yeah. It's so different here. I was reading the the digger, I think it was digger article the other day about how bad mud season is, but here it's like dry. Like I can take my white sponge of a dog out and she comes back just as white after our walk as when we started. Overall, it's dry. There's a fire warning out here and they're not giving any burn permits. Same here. 
especially with the wind that has it's been really windy so that definitely hasn't helped all right um andrea has emailed the neck the the current draft to uh to the committee and she's working behind the scenes to get um to get the latest draft up on the website. So at 8 57 AM today is the, <laughs> that is a fresh draft. <laughs> that was just a couple of minutes before, <laughs> before we started committee. Um, so for folks who are following along at home, um, there's a couple of quick workarounds that we do if uh, if the committee assistant isn't able to get things up onto the committee page from, uh, from where she's working from her home. Um, and so it may take just a few moments for people who are following along to be able to get the draft that is labeled um, 8.57 a.m. with today's date. So uh, committee members, if you are uh, able to access your email, um, you can uh, take a peek at it and we'll go ahead and have Becky start walking us through it. Sure. And it was, it was just a, a small change that I made. So I can point that out when we get there, if it's not up on the web yet. Um, so uh, again, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, this is the committee bill on um, relating to um, governance changes to VPIC as well as creating the pension task force. So um, the uh, bill, just to orient you, is starting out with making some changes um, to the VPIC structure in terms of membership and duties of VPIC. And because um, there are some responsibilities sort of scattered throughout uh, the titles, um, not just in the VPIC section, you'll see that there, I also had to make some changes um, in some other statutory sections. Um, for example, in the boards of those of each retirement system to kind of make some changes to how uh, VPIC will be operating. And then the last section is the task force section. Um, so uh, starting out, um, Section one is uh, amending three VSA, VSA chapter 17, which is the chapter that uh, has all the VPIC statutory sections. Um, I'm not sure why, but this chapter is entitled Vermont State Police and Motor Vehicle Inspectors Retirement System. Um, so I'm taking this opportunity to uh, rename it uh, the Vermont Pension Investment Committee. So that is uh, the first change you'll see there. Um, Section 521 of this chapter um, are all the definitions that are used in the chapter. Uh, so there are some new definitions here. Um, there's a definition for a financial expert, uh, and that is uh, meaning an individual with a material expertise and experience in institutional fund management or other significant pension or other relevant financial experience. Um, there's subdivision three is a new definition of independent. Um, and so that means an individual who does not have a direct or indirect material interest in the plans, um, which is defined in the next subdivision. There's also some language on what independent does not mean. Um, so it does not mean that somebody who, um, including that person's um, family member, such as spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law, who has a material direct or indirect economic relationship in the past five years with the retirement systems. Um, someone who is an employee, director, officer, consultant, or owner of more than 5% of a publicly traded entity, consultant manager, or other material role with any entity servicing the plans. Um, and then the final definition that's being added is what is meant by plans here. So this is referencing the retirement systems for uh, the state employees, the teachers, and the municipal employees. Okay. Um, section 522 is the um, members, membership structure for VPIC. 
Um, so it is going from a set seven member committee to a 10 member committee. Um, the uh, first three members, uh, one member and one alternate are uh, elected by the, uh, the first is the board of the VSCA, uh, sorry, the board of the Vermont State Employees Retirement System. The second uh, member and an alternate are elected by the board of the State Teachers Retirement System. And the third is the, um, those that are elected by the Municipal Employees Retirement System. Um, so this is not, this language is not changing. What I've changed in all three of these um, is language referencing that they may or may not be trustees of the boards of those um, individual systems. And I just took that out as I thought it was sort of redundant because if they may or may not be members, then you don't need to uh, specify that. So I was just cleaning up the language a little bit there. Um, then moving on, the two members and alternates um, that are appointed by the governor, these members now have to be um, financial experts and independent. So they have to meet those uh, new definitions in section 521. Um, the state treasurer is uh, a, now a, a voting member of the committee. Um, and then the, there is the chair in subdivision six that is uh, appointed by all other nine members of the committee. Um, and I just struck out voting here because um, all the other members are now voting members. So it wasn't necessary to specify that. Um, the Commissioner of Finance and Management is added to the committee. And then the final two um, new members are uh, one municipal employer who has to have the requirement of being independent. Um, that's appointed by the Executive Director of um, the League, Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And then finally, one school employer who also has that independence requirement appointed by the School Boards Association. Um, in terms of uh, training for the members, um, so members of the committee have to, are required now to participate in both onboarding and ongoing periodic training and in investment securities and fid fiduciary responsibilities as directed by the committee. Um, I have struck out the language above referencing that the appointing authorities would consider their expertise um, and experience because now there is a requirement that they have to have training. Um, there is the next sentence, the committee shall provide an annual report to the respective authorities on what um, training those members have undergone. That is not new language. I've just moved it from a different section um, to put it all together in, in the training and sort of education part of the in subsection B so that it um, flows a little bit better and easier to find. Any questions on that? Um, I, I do wanna <clears throat> note that, oh, sure. Sorry, uh, when you go back to the voting members, there are now 10, are you saying the chair does not have a vote? Um, yes, so that is specified that the chair this is similar to what is um, in place right now. The chair is not a voting member unless in the case of a tie. Okay. Um, and I'll get to that just in, in a moment. But the other nine members who are electing the chair are all voting members. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to point out in the training section that right now the language says uh, periodic training um, there is some study language further down about um, sort of best practices for VPIC and what periodic would mean. So um, just wanted to point out to the committee that that might be clarified but by a report that uh, would be coming in if this is enacted. Um, so subsection C deals with member terms. So except for the chair and for the treasurer and the commissioner of finance and management, all the members of the committee serve for staggered four-year terms. Um, if there's a vacancy that will be filled in the same manner um, of, as the original appointment, 
And if a member appointed to fill a vacancy created before the expiration of a term um, shall not be deemed to have served that term for the purpose of this section. Uh, so members um, are eligible for reappointment, but cannot serve more than three terms. So the total amount of time that a member can serve is 12 years. There is some transition language for the current members um, that is in the next section. So I will get to how that will work um, in a moment. In terms of the chair of the committee, um, so this is the exception here, the chair can serve not more than 20 years on the committee as either the chair or a committee member. So that would be a total of 20 years. Um, and then there is some language that allows for an interim chair to be elected by the committee um, if the chair is unable to perform his or her duties. Um, if an interim chair is elected, then that person would need to be a financial expert or independent. Um, oh, seeing that there's a mistake here, that there's a, a duplicate section um, on the chair. So I'll skip over that and fix that in the next draft. Um, so terms shall end on June 30th with new terms beginning on July 1st. And uh, it also says that notwithstanding anything um, in the, the timing of the terms, if a member, a member can serve um, their term until their successor is, is appointed. Um, subsection D uh, deals with the chair and the vice chair. So this is where it specifies that the chair is a non-voting member, except in the case of the tie, and that the rest of the committee shall elect a, uh, a vice chair from among its members. Um, there are some eligibility requirements in subsection E. So no legislat legislator who's currently serving in the General Assembly can serve on the, uh, sorry, this is a mistake, I should say serve on the committee. And then um, in subdivision two, um, all members who are appointed or elected have to be state residents. Um, so I just put that for a committee discussion there um, on, on this was in the proposal from VPIC, so I just wanted to put for committee discussion whether you wanted to keep that eligibility requirement. So committee, we can, uh, we can take a pause for a committee discussion about, about this <clears throat> right now, or we can wait and come back to it. I think the, um, you know, there's pros and cons to, to, to having the requirement that, that members of this uh, VPIC B state residents. And so I'm happy to have that discussion. <clears throat> Go ahead, Peter. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Becky. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to go back <clears throat> to my prior interest on continu in continuity and independence. Uh, I'm assuming that the two-year terms um, were part of the previous proposal. Would they run on the election cycle? And I guess that, for me, raises a couple of issues. I can imagine, um, for continuity's sake, uh, wanting the terms to be longer uh, than two years and not uh, except by coincidence on the election cycle for both of those reasons, continuity and independence. So I, I, I think we ought to agree or not agree uh, that two years was okay. I happen to think three would be good because it does stretch out the commitment and it does allow for the election cycle, but only every other time. Um, and, and I kind of, um, again, I'll, I'll address this later, but the balance issue between executive branch folks um, who may or may not come or go uh, <clears throat> with changes in the uh, election cycle, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little leery about that on the same grounds that uh, our uh, um, consultant last week said, you know, you really, you really want to try and insulate this group. Uh, from that kind of um, uh, come, come and go, both turnover and uh, political um, uh, intervention. Thanks. So let's try to separate, <clears throat> let's try to separate from um, asking a technical question about what the words on the page are to legislative council versus um, committee discussion on the policy decisions that really should be 
um, made, uh, you know, should be prompted for committee discussion. So on the technical points, <laughs> Becky. Um, so the, I think the questions that for discussion are um, whether you want to require the committee members to all be state residents. Um, and in terms of the question that was just asked, um, so right now all of the um, all of the members are serving a four-year term, so that's not it's not two years based on the election cycle. Um, there would be a number of members uh, coming on in July 1st of this year, so off off the election cycle, and they would ser serve four-year terms. Um, I think there would be uh, maybe two or three others that would then stagger over the next um, year or two. So maybe one of those would be on an election cycle, but for a four-year term. Um, and I, I think that will be a little clearer when it gets to the transition language in the next section. Uh, Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Becky, uh, I heard the explanation from the treasurer as to why the state resident language was in there. An example was used as somebody that had moved to Florida that has probably 25 years worth of experience on the committee. Uh, and people generally nodded their head, yeah, living in Florida, maybe you're a little too far. Um, but the reality is that people that work at the veterans home live in New Hampshire. People that live you know, work in the other side of the state, live in New York. Uh, the whole airport firefighter department comes from New York for some reason I have never understood. Uh, so this language cuts out effectively from participation in this process, hundreds of planned participants. Um, and that's based on living here or there one day, more or less. I find this to be unacceptable from a participation point, and I would uh, be 100% in favor of it being eliminated. Yeah, and I, I think, um, so I don't, I think it does cut out possible uh, members on the committee based on their residency. The other concern I, I guess I would have is for the, and I, I don't actually know if this is possible, but for the treasurer and the commissioner serving on the on the committee, if if it's possible for them to not be state residents, um, I think I'm I'm not sure if that is even possible, but it it would be a problem for those um, members as well um, to have that requirement if they did not live in the state. And and I'm sensitive to the idea that it's an expense if somebody is flying back to the meetings from Florida, but I'm not flying down to Montpelier for this meeting. Uh, and we've done phone contact for years. So it's it's a little shaky in a lot of areas. Thank you. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I find myself in the unique position of agreeing with my friend from Burlington, but probably for different reasons. Um, one of my primary concerns about this board is to get as much expertise on this as we can possibly get. And if it's a matter of my good friend from Burlington being on it or say Warren Buffett, I might defer to Warren Buffett. Um, so my concern is that I, I don't wanna see us limit this to just the only expertise that we could get within the state of Vermont. I think it's far too important um, to make sure that we get as, many talented and committed people on this as we can. Thank you. Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. How many people on? Oh, hang on. Somehow you got remuted while you were in the middle of your sentence. How many people? Sorry, how many people that are currently on the board? I know there has been a past member who did not live in the state, but how many people currently do not live in the state of Vermont? 
I do not know the answer to that. Bob Hooper knows the answer to that. Bob may not know the complete answer. At least two people have recently taken up residence, legal residence outside the state, but have bopped back and forth a good bit. Um, so I'm saying, I'll say two at this point, both employee representatives. <clears throat> Any other questions or um, committee discussion on this? Uh, it's flagged for a reason, because I think there are, are probably some really legitimate reasons why um, someone with the right skill set might simply happen to live um, part of the year or across a state line. Rob LeClaire? Rob, you need to unmute. <clears throat> Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I did have a question on the independence part, but I can wait to go back to that after because I don't want to hold things up. Okay, any other discussion on residency? Um, so, Rob, do you want to go back to that now or do you want to wait till we've gone through the rest of the draft? Uh, whatever works for you, Madam Chair. I, I waited to hold my questions. I wasn't sure if you want us to go through and then go back or ask as we're going. Let's go ahead and have this discussion now. Okay. Well, it's not a, a very complicated. Um, I think under the independence, there's something about five years that... Um, Sorry, let me get back up to it here. There's a there's a five year time frame here. Uh, so, um, Becky, let's have you review um, the subsection three there that that defines what independent means, and maybe you can help us with some context on where uh, you know where this definition came from. Sure. Um, so it's on, on page two, starting on line one, just to orient you. Um, uh, so this definition was part of the proposal from VPIC. Um, and it is clarifying that independent does not mean that somebody or um, the, the family members that are listed um, who had a material direct or indirect economic relationship in the fa last five years with the plan. Um, and then there are some examples of what uh, economic relationship means here. Um, so that would be an employee, director, officer, consultant, owner of more than 5% of a publicly traded entity, uh, consultant, manager, or other material role with any entity that services the plan. Right. Um, I, I understand most of it. I'm just trying to understand the relationship in the past five years. So. Does, that's not ex excluding somebody that is currently getting a pension from being on the board or considered independent, or excuse me, no. So they wouldn't be considered independent. So say if they had it been six years, would they be considered independent in that definition? Yeah, so this definition, the, the time limit on it is five years. So a greater, a longer time time limit, um, I do not read that to, uh, to sort of trigger them not being independent. Okay, I'm not gonna belabor the point, I'm just trying to understand exactly what that's saying. So I'll read it some more, thank you, sorry. Any other questions, comments so far? Bob Hooper. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, Becky, but uh, two things. The explanation confused me more. And you mentioned this was the VPIC proposal. And I would like to point out for the members at home, this did not come from VPIC, nor did it come from the chair or the vice chair. It came from two individuals, I believe, that testified to it. Um, so indeed, does this remove people who are, say, beneficiaries from serving for five years or? Um, as, a, as an, 
Well, it's not actually talking about beneficiaries of the plan. It's talking about economic relationships in terms of um, the examples that are used are like an employee of, of the plan, a director, officer, consultant, or someone providing services to the plan. So specifically then somebody getting a check from the plan is excluded. That is how I read it. Um, but again, and, and my understanding was that this, the proposal came from VPIC, so I, I can't specify who on VPIC it came from, but it might be um, helpful for them to explain what they were trying to exclude. Thank you. John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I apologize, I have my printer going in the background um, because I was actually printing out the, the VPIC proposal, or I shouldn't say the VPIC, Tom Galaka and Beth Pierce's proposal. Um, I, I think there's a slight drafting error here. And I think the language in the second sentence in subsection three should be, you're not independent if you fall into what the rest of that sentence says. Yeah, so it says that independent does not mean an individual. Yeah. So everything that follows means that you are not independent. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Does it should have it does have a direct or indirect? There is there is an error there. Yep. So what would, uh, do you want to try to clarify that, you know, what it should say right now in case folks want to chew on the definition of independent? Or maybe we want to rework the whole sentence to. Um, yeah, so independent, it should say independent does. Um, uh, here, let me, I'm, I'm just going to pull up the language so I don't. Um, the language that I got because I was really just going off of that proposal. Yeah. Um, yeah. John, <laughs> so to read it to us. The definition that um, was provided to us um, says independent means an individual that does not have a material direct or indirect interest in the plans. An individual is not independent if a sp is not independent. I'm just repeating that. If a spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law is a beneficiary of any of the plans, an individual is not independent if the individual or the individual spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law has a material direct or in indirect economic relationship in the past year with the plans, including without limitation as an employee, director, officer, consultant, owner of more than 5% of an entity if a publicly traded company consultant, manager, or other material role with any ent entity servicing the plans. For example, an actuary, a pension advisor, entities managing money for the plan. So that those, if you fall into any of those categories, you're not independent. And I, I didn't hear anything about the five year. No, it's, it's in there. So in oh. the past five years. So I think where that okay. comes out is, so if you were an actuary or you work for an actuary um, for the plan, if you had, if it's within the last five years, you would not be independent. If it was more than five years, you would be considered independent. Very good, thank you. That helps me. Thank you, John. No problem. All right. Are we ready to move on? clarifying what that means for future drafts. Okay. Okay, so I think we left off on the bottom of page five, um, subsection F under meetings. Uh, so the new um, quorum majority is six members of the committee. Um, the, if a member is not in attendance, the alternate of that member shall be eligible to act as a member of the committee. Um, and I, I guess I did wanna point out here on this point that the proposal did not specify alternates. Um, they are still in the draft. Um, so I don't know if that's another committee discussion point. 
Um, but I, I just wanted to point out that this draft is keeping the alternate structure, although the proposal did not mention alternates. Um, and then top of page six, um, six concurring votes shall be necessary for a decision of the committee. Um, oh, it looks like there's... Bob Hooper has a question. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, uh, alternates are important, I think, for the employee boards because one, people are working and don't have control over their own schedule. So alternates fill in a lot. Uh, and it's also kind of a seed bed for people to get their feet wet in this. Um, secondly, quorum wise and voting wise, it sticks in my mind in the original statute, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, quorum was not only based on the number in attendance, but also the component of the number that were in tens. So if there were nobody there from the municipal board, no action could be taken because they effectively had no input into the vote. Um, that looks like it got eliminated. Is that accurate? Um, I don't actually recall. So you're saying that it said if it, it was referencing the number of um, vote, voting members present? Well, in the current structure with the six people, if there's no representation from certain sections of the composition of the body that doesn't matter how many people you have, you have to have somebody representing the individual groups there. Um, so that something doesn't happen that they don't have input in. Um, I don't know that we've ever had that problem, but yeah, it's, like, I don't, I don't door. recall that being in statute. I don't know if that was just a could be a committee policy. Could be. Uh, uh, Rob Leclerc. Um, is there any expectation that the alternates would um, be expected to go through any of the uh, periodic training investments? Yes. There is. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. So I the, the language does just say members um, of the committee. I think I can I should clarify that to say members and alternates. Um, just so to make that clear. Thank you, that's why I asked that question. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Just to add to that point, we had a attorney general's opinion from 2009, I think that if the VPIC structure required, anybody could be uh, mandated to have training. So that, I suspect that would still be the rule. Although, what this change does to existing VPIC policy would be an interesting question to hear at some point too. Thanks. Okay. Um, so moving to the top of page six under meetings, um, there's some language that is struck out on lines two through seven relating to uh, administrative support to the committee. Um, I just wanna point out this was not, this is struck out here, but it is moved to um, a different subsection just for uh, sort of clarity um, and, and reorganization of this uh, section. Um, leave time in subsection G, um, there's no changes here. So the public employee members and alternates are granted reasonable leave time to attend committee meetings. Um, subsection H is compensation and reimbursement. Um, so members and alternates who are uh, not public employees shall be entitled to compensation um, through the, uh, for reimbursement for all necessary expenses and the chair uh, is compensated um, from funds at a level not to exceed one third of the salary of the state treasurer. This is all, again, language that was in there. It's just moved from a different uh, portion of this section. Um, subsection I is now the administrative and legal support section. So 
Um, I've just consolidated here that the state treasurer uh, provides administrative support to the committee and the attorney general serves as legal counsel, um, a legal advisor to the committee. And again, this was all language that was in there, but just moved around. John Gannon, um, on the quorum issue. Um, yeah, so I, I just checked the statute, um, 3 VSA section 522 um, F. So the language is four members of the, and this is the current language, four members of the committee shall constitute a quorum. If a member is not in attendance, the alternate of that member shall be eligible to act as a member of the committee during the absence of that member. Four concurring votes shall be necessary for a decision of the committee at any meeting of the committee. Okay, and that's current, that's current statute. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I don't recall anywhere else where it mentioned a requirement of voting members present at the meeting. Yeah. So we may wanna adjust the quorum number up. I mean, so. Yeah, I think we did. We Isn't it now, what's the quorum, six? Six. Now it's for, six. Uh, for, uh, um, for a decision, but what's six members of the committee shall constitute a quorum? Uh, Bob Hooper. Thank you once again, Madam Chair. Um, so John, default to your reading, uh, there is something somewhere though that references that. Uh, we passed over the one third salary point that the treasurer had brought up should maybe be re given reconsideration. And I know that Tom puts in a lot more time than anybody I've seen before. so not necessarily linking it to one individual, but um, worthy of consideration. And secondly, there have been situations where, um, quite frankly, VPIC has not agreed with the opinion of the Attorney General. Um, is there provision for outside or alternate counsel? Is that ever done? That has come up, I think, in discussion a couple of times. Could there be, I guess, is maybe the better phrase. Um, so the language right now just provides that the AG serves as legal advisor. Of course, you can um, you can change it. I think the committee also does have some, under the duties of the committee, I think they have some authority to, I think, perhaps hire, yeah, contract out um, for other services, but it, it doesn't specify legal services. So if, if that's something the committee would like to discuss, perhaps you'd just wanna be explicit about that in the statute. Let's flag that. And, um, and then also just recalling that um, there's a section in here that, uh, that directs VPIC to, uh, to hire an independent consultant to talk about certain aspects of their reorganization and maybe that's something we want to add to um, to their report back in the future on whether they feel they should have uh, different counsel. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question from the member from Wilmington, what he said about the four concurring votes for, for the quorum currently. I'll give you a minute to get back there. What, what can you read that again, John? Just sure. Um, so you just the concurring sentence. Four well, the, go okay, ahead. I'll, start, I'll start with the beginning of um, subsection F. Four members of the committee shall constitute a quorum. If a member is not in attendance, the alternate of that member shall be eligible to act as a member of the committee during the absence of that member. Four concurring votes shall be necessary for a decision of the committee at any meeting of the committee. Okay, that's the question. So, so that's basically saying that you have to have a unanimous vote. If you only have if you only have a quorum of four, you would have to have a yeah. unanimous vote. That's correct. Okay, okay, that's all I was looking for clarification on that. Thank you, Bob. 
Um, so in the context of quorum versus membership, are we effectively taking what looks like a <clears throat> two thirds majority to move forward and moving it down to a simple majority? If we're going so up. Before there were seven members on the committee. Um, so four out of seven uh, with, well, the chair was a non-voting, it, it was four out of six, I guess, um, and the chair could break a tie. So this would be six out of nine and the chair could break a tie. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we move on? All right, go ahead. Um, so I'm just highlighting, uh, just based on a question, I'm highlighting in the draft that the salary of the chair um, and the legal advisor as sort of Thank you. Uh, discussion points. Yeah. Um, so on page seven, section 523, this is the duties of the committee. Um, so if you move to page eight, this is where um, some changes were made. Subsection B, you'll notice some struck out language. Um, this was language that uh, spoke to the compensation for committee members. Um, I just moved that to the previous section because it, it didn't really make sense in the, the duties portion of this uh, section. So I moved that to the, the membership section in 522. Um, so now the, the powers and duties listed here um, so the committee shall set the following actuarial assumptions, and that includes the investment rate of return, the inflation rate, and the smoothing rate method used for the actuarial valuation of assets and returns. And then there is a requirement that um, not more than 90 days after the end of each fiscal year, the committee has to conduct an asset allocation study that reviews the expected return of each fund, including a risk, risk analysis using best practices methodologies to, um, to estimate potential risks of the fund assets over a five, 10 and 20 year period. And uh, the remainder of the statutory amortization period. Um, so the study is submitted to the General Assembly, the governor's office, and then made publicly available on the website, uh, the treasurer's website within 10 days of being completed. Um, page nine, uh, there are some, the, the record keeping requirement um, that has stayed the same. Subsection D is policies. So uh, again, this is the same that the committee had the ability to formulate policies and procedures to carry out its functions. Um, what I've added here is some language, which is for discussion um, that I'll get to a little later. There's some language in the uh, state employees retirement board section of the statute that references that the treasurer uh, uh, sets by rule standards of conducts for members and employees of the committee. Um, for now, I've just moved that here and I've highlighted it in those uh, in the board statutory section just for discussion of, of whether the treasurer should be setting that those rules or um, whether it's something that the committee itself should be setting. Um, subsection E is the contracts language. So I just, I mentioned this that the contracts approved by the committee um, may be executed by the chair or vice chair. So um, it is possible for the committee to enter into contracts. Uh, subsection F is an asset and liability study. Um, so beginning July 1st of 2022, and then every three years thereafter, um, based on the most recent actuarial evaluations of the plans, the committee has to study the assets and liabilities of each plan over a 20 year period. That would look at project, uh, the study shall project the expected path of the key indicators of each plan's financial health based on all current actuarial and investment assumptions current contribution and benefit policies, and that includes the plan's mark-to-market funded ratio, actuarial required contributions by source, 
payout ratio and related uh, liquidity obligations. And then um, the study would also project the effect on each plan's financial health that results from uh, deviations from plan assumptions and investment assumptions, uh, and then possible material deviations from key plan actuarial assumptions, including retiree longevity, potential benefit increases, and inflation. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the last point there is the, the, a key one. I mean, I think we've come to understand that Vermont's experience is somewhat deviant from uh, the national trends, but we're asking for a lot more reporting here. That reporting comes with a dollar sign attached to it. Are we considering appropriations specifically for that in this package, or are we just gonna have the fund absorb it? Significant cost. There is no specific appropriation for the additional studies in the bill. There are some other, uh, there are some appropriations in this bill, but not specifically for those new duties. Rob, we, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's kind of along the same questions as the member from Burlington. Is, is it, This looks very comprehensive. I'm just curious to know, and maybe you can't answer this, um, perfect, but how much different is this reporting than what we're currently getting or being required? Do you know? Thank you. I, I actually don't know the answer to, okay, to how much more detail this is requiring. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Uh, Mike McCarthy. I actually should ask this later because we're trying to stick to the, the technical questions. So I'll, I'll hold. Okay. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to uh, just back up a little bit to on the reporting language that you're suggesting, Becky. Um, you, I think you use uh, very general terms like administration and legislature. I, I'm a little uncomfortable with the fact that there's no specificity there, um, that the report uh, should be delivered to the legislature, uh, seems to me unreassuring given, given the current challenge that uh, several of our members have said we didn't we never knew we never saw it we didn't know about it so I guess flag that for precision uh, for for sort of tooling up to be very specific as to where it goes the results of those periodic reports thanks sure that, and that's correct for the the one study asset allocation study right now the language just has it going to the general assembly but the committee could of course decide to have that directed to certain committees instead yeah and um you know we we should make sure that we go through all of this with an eye towards um how do we want to trigger the legislature to um you know, to to cue into some of the uh, some of this transparency and reporting um, that that we're doing uh, in an attempt to make sure that we see trends um, before uh, before they become humongous problems. Any other questions? All right, let's go back to the language. Uh, Rob McClare now has a question. Go ahead. Well, it's kind of more of a statement, Madam Chair, to follow up on what you just said that um, if, if we've got a problem and it's large enough that it's getting to the legislature, um, that tells me that we don't have the right process in place or the right people involved if it's got to get to that point. Does that make sense what I'm trying to I think, I mean, the whole exercise here is just to make sure that we don't end up having these issues grow to the magnitude that they are, or wait for the amount of time that's transpired before they get addressed. Right. And I guess my stepping back from the language that's in front of us and just talking aspirationally about what I think should happen, I would like to, I would like to feel assured that 
the more frequent valuation studies and the and the transparency that we're uh, putting in here is going to trickle back to the beneficiaries as well because this is their fund, this is their money, um, and we certainly would want them. You know, we want to create, <clears throat> I think, processes and systems where, um, you know, teachers and state employees uh, have have a better sense, a more regular. Uh, view of how their plans are performing. Um, I, I agree, Madam Chair. Thank you. So let's flag that and make sure that we feel we have obtained that um, before we move this bill out of committee. Um, and there is another section on annual reports uh, that perhaps addresses that. Yes. Um, so on page 10, subsection G, uh, the actual changes to actuarial rate of return. Um, current law says that uh, any changes to the actuarial rate of return would be a joint, sort of a joint decision between the committee and the appropriate retirement board. Um, and this language uh, makes that uh, the sole responsibility of the committee. So any changes to the actuarial actuarial rate of return shall be made by the committee. All right, uh, annual reports, subsection H. Um, so beginning January 15th and then every year thereafter. Um, so this is specifically submitted to the GovOps committees in the House and the Senate. Um, top of page 11, there's a report on the performance of each plan versus its bet benchmark over three, five, seven, and 10 year periods. And the funding ratio of each plan to each plan beneficiary at the end of the fiscal year. And a report on the status of the funding and investment performance of each plan and any relevant information from the asset liability and scenario testing completed during the prior fiscal year. Um, I wanted to note that there was something in the proposal about the, the chair being shall testify to the GovOps committees every year. Um, I chose not to put that in just because I, I think it's sort of at the discretion of the committees um, to make that decision. But of course, if there's a way you'd like me to incorporate that, I can, I can make that change to the language. Okay, let's flag that in the back of our minds, folks. Um, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> in subsection two there, you mentioned funding and investment performance of each plan. Funding, I would assume, is the funded ratio. And when you call out each plan, are you saying state and teachers, or are you dividing it into information that has been asked for and not received on the individual A, C, D, and F plans that exist now? How detailed is that summary expected to be? I would like it to see it very detailed and this language doesn't necessarily reflect that. I could, I, I can work a, on the language if that's a-, a That's a that policy we, decision that yeah. we should talk about um, because I, the way I read this, it would be you know state employees and teachers as opposed to group, group D, group, uh, C, et cetera. And, and, the, and the plans are also defined to include the municipal employee system as well. Yeah. And my point on that has been, if you don't know where the problem is coming from, you don't necessarily know how to solve it. Yeah. Uh, Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Becky. I guess to riff off uh, Bob Hooper, uh, if this is providing a basis, for instance, uh, for another body um, to uh, deal with uh, reformation, whether it's our task force that we're envisioning or some other body. It really, uh, as Bob said, uh, it, the more detail, the better. Uh, so we're not essentially lumping um, an adjustment that should be made together with adjustments that needn't be made. Uh, depending on the groups we're talking about. And so I would err on, again, 
disaggregation. Uh, but thanks again, that's partly policy, but also, again, if this is supposed to inform some other body that makes changes, I think that other body would be well served with more information. Thanks. Rob LeClaire. Um, I, I can understand where the two former members are going with this. My question is, is um, I'm not sure that you can extrapolate this level of detail from something along this lines, because I can see where there's going to be a commingling of investment funds. There could be a commingling of expenses, but um, it clearly would be a good question to get answered. But I think you'd have to go to a, an outside source for that to see if you could get that level of detail. Well, it also it occurs to me that if we're looking at you know Group F, Group D, Group C, that on any given year, there's going to be fluctuations, and so I understand the desire for transparency about that. But I wonder if we could, if if it would be better to put that requirement somewhere else, and not and not because it's a snapshot in time. And if you had, you know, in a in a very small group, if you had a bunch of people retire, uh, you know, an, an above average year. Um, that could throw off the, the way that looks relative to the other groups within the plan. So um, let's flag that. John, John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with respect to investment performance, I do believe you, that we have seen investment performance by plan. I do not think you can't divide that into groups. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that can be done um, because the assets of a plan are, are invested as a total. Um, with respect to the funding status, I mean, we, we can look into that. Um, I, I do think it's an important issue to look into, um, but you know, perhaps that's something um, that should be the role of the task force to identify any differences between the groups um, and working on that um, rather than putting that information here. Um, but. But that's my thought. Thanks. All right. Well, let's let's flag that because I've heard this um, this desire for information expressed a number of times. So let's see if we can um, uh, let's see if we can find the right place for that. Back to the language. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to section two on page uh, eleven. Uh, so this is the transition of the member terms. Um, so beginning uh, July 1st of this year, um, members shall be appointed to fill the new seats that um, are referenced in section 522A7 through nine. And those, that's the commissioner of finance um, and management, the uh, school employer and the municipal employer, those are our new seats that need to be filled. Uh, sorry, I see a question. Go ahead, John. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to note that th this transition language is, is different than what was in the proposal um, because in, in talking to legislative council and the chair, um, I found the transition language um, in the proposal to be very confusing. Um, so th this is an attempt to clarify um, what was in that proposal. Um, I don't think any of us understood the exact transition language that was in the proposal. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, thank you. I should have mentioned that as well. Um, so this is this is this does deviate from that proposal. Um, so the second point in terms of the the members, the current members who are uh, not new seats on the board. Um, so they would serve until the June 30th in the year prior to the expiration of their current terms or June 30th, 2023, whichever is earlier. Um, and they can be reappointed if they meet all of the eligibility and term limit requirements that are in um, section 522. Uh, so Looking at the current terms, um, there are three members right now who are set to, their terms are set to expire June 30th, 2022. 
So those would have those three members um, and being uh, replaced as of June 30th of this year as well. So that would be six new members on the board as of um, June 30th. And then there are two more after that that um, are a little more staggered. Um, and so those two would be uh, replaced in June 30th, 2022, and then one in June 30th, 2023. Bob Hooper. So this is maybe clearer, but significantly different from what we saw before. Um, I think members were comfortable with serving out their term. I'm not sure members are gonna be comfortable with shortened terms just to accommodate a cycle. And quite frankly, I don't see the exemption. I actually think that we should have on the table whether or not the employee group can appoint anybody they choose because it's their money, their involvement. And quite frankly, under this scheme, they're a minority uh, at three to seven. Uh, and if the governor wants to abide by those restrictions that are in place, that's fine. But um, that's something I'd like to have conversation about. So in terms of the first statement, um, I think there, I think that there's uh, room in here for folks whose terms are expiring to then be reappointed by their respective board. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that there's some wholesale um, switch over that, uh, that it could, it could simply mean that uh, a retirement board um, reappoints someone who's currently on the VPIC. Am I remembering that correctly, Becky? Yeah, so this says that current members may be reappointed. Um, they just have to meet the eligibility qualification and term limits. So for example, they would not be able to be reappointed if they had already served 12 years, but that is, I believe, a current requirement anyway, um, where currently they serve four staggered terms, uh, three consecutive years, I believe. Um, four year terms, three consecutive years. Um, what would, I guess, limit the reappointment would be the other eligibility requirements in terms of qualification, although I would note for the um, the state employee retirement board appointees and the teachers retirement board and municipal retirement board appointees, there are no financial expert or independent requirements on those boards uh, for those appointees. And it deserves more consideration and I think conversation with the boards and others involved. So it's a flag at this point for me. Thanks. Rob LeClaire. Okay. Uh, again, I find myself agreeing with the member from Burlington, but maybe for different reasons that I'm still trying to understand and I'm certainly willing to have somebody uh, educate me on what having these folks perspective brings to this fund's overall success as far as the VPIC on the investment side. Other questions, comments, committee discussion on that? John Gannon. Um, Rob, if you don't mind, could you just explain that a little more, please? Uh, absolutely. Um, one of my main focuses around this has been and will continue to be to get as much expertise on these boards, on this particular board, as we can get. And as much as I understand the current structure and totally appreciate people becoming involved and to have the best intentions, I still want to understand what having them on the board and bringing their perspective to it 
does for the investment side of this. So can I ask you another question, Rob? So when you say that, um, are you referring to the um, members of the plan or, or some other group? I'm just trying to understand yeah. who you're focused on. Um, well, I, I would say the employee and the employer, but in particular, the employee, the plan, benef the plan beneficiaries, um, I believe it's the representatives from the other boards. Um, again, what does their being a member of this particular committee, what does their perspective bring from the investment side of things? Got it. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, no, no, now I understand where you're coming from. I just, I just wanna make sure I understood um, what right. you were suggesting. Um, and I'm willing to have somebody explain it to me. I'm just asking that question. No, I think it's a valid question, and 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 it's sort of the essence of what we're uh, what we're talking about here is what is what is the proper makeup of the committee that's going to make the investment decisions, um, and how can we uh, you know how can we make sure that we have the strongest perspectives on that committee, um, understanding that best practices are um, you know the that appointments to that committee should come through each of the retirement system boards uh, so that they have uh, influence and, uh, and uh, direct link to the investment decisions. Uh, much better said, Madam Chair, than myself. My, um, I guess the one last comment I would make is I think it's absolutely imperative and extremely important that they have a presence, but I feel it's more on the benefit side, but we can have that conversation as well. Okay, hold that thought, Peter Anthony. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, and thank you, Rob, for sharpening that up. I, I in the original Galanka slash Pierce proposal, notice it was a larger board, then there was a subcommittee that was focused virtually exclusively on the investment expertise and investment strategy. The way this is crafted, and I, I, I favored, frankly, reducing the size from 15 now to something more like what's on the table. But having done that, uh, the uh, investment focus becomes a committee of the whole. And I, I think it would be uh, too bad if the emphasis on the expertise and the investment side uh, took precedence over the skin in the game and the, uh, if you like, accountability with the underlying beneficiaries were lost. And, and that's why I'm comfortable with the fact that it's a mix between expertise and also connection with the uh, community that the fiduciaries are serving namely the beneficiaries. So thanks. Mike McCarthy. I think this is this is really fascinating. Um, and to Representative Anthony and Representative LeClaire's points, you know, I think this strikes a balance between saying we need to have folks who have, you know, are going to have the the trust and faith of the the participant boards there. Uh, at the table, but that even those folks need to have a certain level of expertise. And I think that having that brings, it'll give me as a member of the public, you know, just a, a, a taxpayer and a person re representing taxpayers, a lot more confidence that there's just the fiduciary responsibility, that, that the overwhelming guiding principle of the people who are on this new version of VPIC will be making the decisions in the interests of the plans, mitigating risk, uh, uh, maximizing performance within those risk tolerances, and that it's not about you know, setting rates of return that are gonna make the projections be rosier than they should be. I mean, getting back to first principles about why we're doing this is that the VPIC in the not too distant past was making decisions about rate of return that we're just not realistic 
you know, we missing assumptions. And I think that we really need to have folks who have the confidence of the participant organizations there, but that even those folks, everybody who's on this new VPIC needs to have some degree of expertise and financial background. Um, you know, the, we, we will still have the trustee boards on the plan and benefit side. So thanks. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, just to, to confirm what Rep McCarthy just said, I, I mean, re extensive research shows that having board members with financial expertise improves investment performance. Um, so his comments are backed up by the research that's out there. Um, so we've gone from having no requirement um, for any sort of financial expertise to having at least some requirement while still keeping a balance um, and having stakeholders on VPIC, which is also important for a different reason, which is to ensure that the decisions made by VPIC have some legitimate legitimacy um, with, the, with the state employees and the teachers and the municipal employees. So I think we, you know, there's a good balance struck here. Thank you. Hal Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think it's important uh, that, that this kind of balance be really um, respected for, for what, what it can accomplish. And I think when you bring together um, folks from different perspectives and experiences and outlooks, um, they're, they're best poised to deal with problems, um, problem solving, um, because they're not coming from a, 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 a myopic perspective of being this expert. So I think it's a, it's, it's a rich blend um, that can um, bode well for problem solving as this body will certainly have to uh, manage. Bob Hooper. Bob, you need to unmute. Or Peter. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I probably agree with everything that Hal said uh, and, and actually have some facts to back it up. But uh, to clarify something that Mike said, the underlying boards have absolutely nothing to do with benefit or plan design. That happens right here. This is a legislative action. Those boards don't deal with that at all. Uh, Financial expertise, yeah, it's a great thing, but the Boston University study also says that um, a good mixture of employee, employer type people uh, adds to the, the, the possibility of moving forward in financial success. I don't like the balance that we're proposing now, three to seven is, is pretty out of whack, uh, but specifically to what uh, Hal said, I mean, over the course of my history with this, the first decision that I got in on when I became a VSEA council member was an employee driven motive to get us out of South, Af South African investment. And that came from the employee sectors, the people that don't have financial expertise, but know Vermont and know what social aspects should be. The same thing with tobacco, same thing with energy, same thing with board composition on the groups that come to ask us to invest money with them. Linda Deladuku, who just died, always ask, how many women, how many people of color? What's your, what's your structure in terms of that stuff? There's a responsibility that we have, I think, as Vermonters to make sure that we're not throwing money down a hole that uh, goes to places we as a just society don't want it to go for them. And that sort of initiative has always come from the employee side. Thank you. Shall we go back to the draft? All right. Go ahead, Becky. Okay. Um, so I will uh, move on to section three, um, which has some reports specific, specifically due in FY 2023. Um, so first, uh, the committee before January 15th of next year has to develop a written policy for implementing both the asset allocation study and the asset and liability studies 
that are re now required by statute. And those policies uh, would be publicly available on the committee's website. And then um, before July 1st of this year, the committee would be hiring an independent third party to review and report on the operations of the committee um, and the retirement division of the treasurer's office and make recommendations on best practices and necessary actions to make the committee a standalone entity. Uh, the report would be looking at um, budgetary authority, frequency of training, so that I, I referenced that earlier about how often committee members should be trained, um, transfer or hiring of personnel and compensation. Um, and this report would be submitted to the uh, House and Senate GovOps committees by January 15th of next year. And the date for hiring the uh, consultant um, is early as July 1st, but my understanding was that there is already, this process is already um, sort of started. So that date is, is perhaps achievable. Questions, comments, suggestions on the either the policies in Section A or the independent review in Section B. Anything you want to add to that? Only money again, Madam Chair. Funding. Well, it was my understanding that the last time VPIC met you had a conversation about hiring a consultant. And so what was that? What was the plan of attack the last time VPIC had this conversation? It, it is that, but frankly, anytime that money's gonna come out of the fund to do something that sort of is in respect to a legislative mandate, I think we should at least question whether or not taking it out of the fund is appropriate. Okay, well, this is in here because it was a direction that the VPIC was already heading. Um, so uh, it's not exactly a legislative mandate from that standpoint, but I'm happy to have the discussion about that. Um, John Gannon? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, there's a number of places where additional reports are required. Um, but, you know, to the extent that these reports improve VPIC um, and the performance of our investments, the, the that, that we improve our actuarial assumptions, especially our assumed rates of return, those benefit the plan. So if there's a cost to improve um, those actions, then I, I don't see it as a big issue that they'd be borne by the plan. Um, I think the cost is gonna be small compared to the potential losses from poor decision-making around uh, assumed rates of return or investment performance. So, uh, I mean, I think that has to be taken into consideration too. Okay, uh, we'll just flag the, um, the independent review uh, and if there are other aspects of, um, of reorganization of governance that, uh, that, that we think are important to consider or that members of VPIC or the retirement boards think are important, we, we can certainly uh, consider them as well. Are we ready to move on? All right, thanks okay. Becky. Um, section four is, so now we're moving to a different statutory section. This has to, this deals with the retirement board for the state employees association. Um, sorry, state employees retirement system. Um, and this is the change here on line 22 is uh, requiring that the uh, actuarial investigation is done um, a th over three year, every three years rather than every five years. And I've had to make this same change in three different places because it is um, in each plan statutory, each board's st statutory section. Um, page 13, section five, um, I mentioned this earlier, I'm just highlighting this for committee discussion. Uh, in the state employees retirement system language, there is uh, the subsection D in section 472 that talks about conflicts of interest. Um, and it, um, 
to be honest, I wasn't entirely sure what all of this meant. So it might be helpful to have uh, someone from VPIC uh, or the treasurer's office discuss how this is done in practice. But um, it looks like the treasurer is uh, tasked with setting the approval, uh, setting the, the rule standards of conducts for trustees, um, members, and employees of the board and the committee. Um, and there's some examples of what would be prohibited uh, actions on the, on the parts of those individuals. Um, so as I mentioned, I moved some of this to the VPIC uh, committee uh, requirements under their policies that they would be setting those policies for themselves um, for part of this, but I, I uh, did not move all of it because I, I wasn't sure what was necessary and, and even what some of this language was trying to uh, get at. So I think this is just per perhaps a, a section for further committee discussion. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, this is, I mean, I think at the back of our mind when we're talking about this, we should always be considering that on the table also is separating this completely from the treasurer's office. So uh, making some move at independence is a good thing. Uh, there, there has been an ongoing, when we talk about education, uh, generally when you go to a uh, conference or something, somebody will have a, a dinner that is sponsored by somebody and we've always been excluded from that because of very, very, very tight newspaper exposure to kind of rules. Uh, I think the committee has lost out. So that's something we also should maybe consider talking about anyway. At some point, maybe when the treasurer is here. Okay, any other committee discussion? Um, so some of this, again, is going to be repetitive, but section six is making the change from the five-year to the three-year period for the actuarial investigation um, in the teacher's retirement system. And then section seven is highlighting that same conflict of interest language in the teacher's section. Um, and then sections eight and nine are the same for the municipal em uh, employees retirement system. So section eight is the switch to the three-year period and section nine is just highlighting that uh, conflict of interest language. Thank you. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Matthew. This is just kind of a general question. Does anybody have any idea what these actuarial studies cost, the ones that are required every three to five years? Does anybody have an idea? I don't know. Yes, as a matter of fact, Chris Roop has an idea. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris from Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, I, I recently uh, reached out to the Treasurer's Office on this very question. And, uh, you know, the, the most recent experience study uh, cost it in the ballpark of about seventy dollars to $75,000. So um, that I, I believe that there, there may be a contract update happening at some point in the near future. So that amount may change um, in the future. But that's the, the cost of the most recent one was in that ballpark. And I can track down in my inbox the exact dollar figure um, from the email I got, but it was in that ballpark of about 75,000. Close enough, thank you. Amla Fave. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can I be reminded of the difference um, it would make to have the actuarial study versus the stress test and what those numbers would do? Because from my experience, if you look at things too closely, sometimes you don't get a full picture of where they're going, while it is good to see if things we had done in the past are uh, doing what they're supposed to do. But what is, would the stress test also look at if we would be setting ourselves up to handle a bad situation and how frequently have we done those? So I'm going to go back to Chris, I guess, at this point and have you um, I just remind you that we are citizen legislators and we don't necessarily have an instant definition in our head of stress test and uh, actuarial review and all of that. So if there's anything that you can help um, Sam and the rest of us understand, you know, what what are these tests and uh, reports that we're looking at? Sure. Uh, so at sort of a very high level, there, there's there's three um, 
three studies that the pensions typically, pension systems typically do on a regular basis. One is the valuation study. They do that every year. And uh, they, you know, in the valuation study, the that's where they calculate, they, they take a look at back at what's happened in the fund over the last fiscal year. They'll recalculate the unfunded liability. Um, you know, what is your value of assets? What should the ADAC payment be? And that informs um, the budget. So um, due to timing issues, the FY20 experience study will inform, you know, what goes into the FY22 budget because that study isn't done until about halfway through FY21. Um, you know, that, and and they they take sort of a, a lighter uh, examination than the experience studies, which currently happen every five years. The experience studies will take a deeper dive and they'll look at, um, you know, what has been going on since the last experience study um, with our workforce participation. Um, what did we think was going to happen? Um, and, you know, are any changes in the assumptions warranted going forward? So um, that's where they do the deeper dive. And, you know, I think there is you, the, the timing of that, I think is a really fair question. You, you probably don't want to do the experience study every year because you don't want short term um, trends or, or short term, you know, things happening that really, really skew your longer term assumptions. So, you need to you need to find that sweet spot where you're not having your experience and assumptions lag each other too badly, but you also want to make sure you're getting you know a, a complete picture or, or a more realistic picture of what's happening. And then the stress test, which I'm a little less familiar about, focuses a little bit more on the asset side, and and they'll take a look at you know based on where your assets are and what your liabilities and costs are likely to be in the future. You know what what will happen in a variety of market scenarios. So I remember. When I was sitting at the trustee table in Philadelphia, they would run, when they did our stress test, they would run a scenario of what would happen to the fund if we get another great recession and we see a 30% drop in the asset value. What does that do to our longer term projection? So, um, you know, those are all sort of important studies that look at slightly different angles of the issue. And, uh, you know, a lot of these are, are likely already done on a regular basis, just as a matter of good fund administration but um, codifying them in statute certainly couldn't hurt as well. Does that, does that help? <laughs> that helps me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. I know we've gone over these like many times, but it's hard when, it's hard and I appreciate the reminder. And um, Chris, would you know the last time that we had a stress test done? I, I would have to ask the no. treasurer's office that. Um, John, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Rob Leclerc. Oh, thank you, man. Um, what do you, what did you call it, Chris? When you look back over the prior year, it's not a stress yeah. test. What was your term? The the first one I mentioned, the valuation study. Valuation study. Thank you. Um, is the the board that uh, is looking at that valuation study is the only option they have to recommend um, the employer contribution for that year? I, I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, the, the ADAC calculation is arrived at through the valuation study, and it's, it's really based on a math exercise. You know, they'll, they'll take a look at, you know, how many retirees do you have? How many actives do you have? What, where are you right now in, in terms of your liabilities and you know, your unfunded liabilities and your assets and how many years left do you have to go on the amortization schedule? So um, that's kind of the point at which, you know, people use that sort of mortgage analogy, but you know, that's the point at which they're recalculating what your balance should be on the mortgage and what your payment should be for the next year. So I don't know to what extent the boards can, can exercise any discretion over that. It tends to be a report that's conducted by the actuaries and then, you know, the ADEC calculation that, that results from that um, is then, you know, sent to, sent to the legislature and the administration would form the budget process. Okay, thank you. John Gannon. Thank you. I, I just want to return to Samantha's question about stress testing. Um, to my knowledge, um, the pen, our pensions have never been, our assets have never been stress tested. All right, um, 
any other committee discussion on the flagged language here with respect to um, the, the members of VPIC? Or shall we move on? Um, oh. Bob? Cursor is never where you need it to be. Um, I, it, because of the interrelation between VPIC and the underlying boards, I think we should give some consideration to uh, the training of the lower boards and maybe the release time function of that just as a matter of consideration at this uh, point. What I, do you, what do you, you said release time? Yeah, the members, basically we had a section in this language which said uh, anybody that works for the state will be afforded reasonable release time for the BPIC function. There's, you know, a, an interplay between that and the lower level state employee, municipal and teachers board. Uh, at this point, I think that anybody that does that sort of stuff, uh, they don't automatically get consideration for education. It's kind of a function of whether personnel wants to give it to them. Uh, so if education is important, then it should be easily accessible. Okay, um, so you're suggesting exploring expanding this governance reorganization to include um, mandating time off for people who are serving on the different system boards? Well, effectively, I would think that we as would only have access to reach into the state agency of administration. I would think that, I, you know, that's a gray area for me, whether we could tell the principal in some school that they have to release a teacher to go to a training. Uh, but I'm certainly open to that. Because quite frankly, I think what's going to develop is that on this, on the board side, the people who come to VPIC and get elected to these seats and require some kind of prior uh, exposure, it's going to be a, you know, a farm team, basically. So putting people in that capacity that know what they're doing is probably a good thing. And if it's helpful, I can just read that that language that says uh, the statutory language for VPIC has um, public employee members and alternates shall be granted reasonable leave time by their employees to attend committee meetings and committee related educational programs. And it's but it, the point, Becky, is that it's beyond VPIC down into the underlying board. Yeah, Thank so there's no there's no corresponding language for the individual boards. Okay. We will hear from uh, the individual boards, I'm sure, as we um, as we move forward with discussing this this week. So let's flag that as something that we'd like to ask them about whether they feel they need help in getting the getting the time to uh, to do training with their uh, their board members. John Gannon, did you want to say something? No, I was just going to point to the language that Becky already pointed to. Thanks. Okay. Great. All right. Should we keep moving? Okay. Um, so the last uh, section is section 10, which is the task force. So we're moving away from the VPIC um, governance changes. Uh, so uh, the creation of uh, actually, for some context, um, there was a, a task, similar task force, I think the committee has discussed, that was um, created in uh, 2009. So some of this language is, is modeled off of that, um, although the membership of this task force is, is different from that previous commission. Um, so the task force is created to review and report on the design and funding of retirement and retiree health benef benefit plans. And this is just for the state employees retirement system and the state teachers retirement system. So um, the focus of this task force is just those two systems and not the municipal system. Uh, the membership of this task force are three current members of the house, not all from the same political party who shall be appointed by the speaker. Uh, three Senate members, not all from the same party, appointed by the Committee on Committees. 
the director of the retirement division of the uh, state treasurer's office, the commissioner of financial regulation, uh, the commissioner of human resources. There would be two members appointed by the president of the NEA, uh, two members appointed by uh, the president of the VSEA, uh, one school board member appointed by the committee on committees, and then one member of the business community appointed by the speaker. Um, there are, are some requirements that the, uh, the uh, House and Senate members um, in subdivision 2A shall not be direct or indirect beneficiaries of either system. And subdivision B, that the other members, uh, the, uh, the employee members would be, um, would not, shall not be currently serving as a legislator or the spouse or partner of an individual currently serving as a legislator. So subsection C, the powers and duties of the, the task force, um, it would be making recommendations about plan design, benefit provisions, and appropriate funding sources, along with other recommendations that are, um, it deems appropriate, um, that have to be consistent with actuarial and government accounting standards, as well as demographic and workforce trends and the long-term sustainability of the benefit programs. And then there's some more specific uh, considerations that they'll be looking at. So first is an evaluation of current benefit structures and contribution characteristics in comparison to other public and private systems. Um, next is an estimate of the cost of current and proposed benefit structures on a budgetary pay-as-you-go basis and full actuarial accrual basis. Um, there would be a five-year review of benefit expenditure levels as well as employer and employee contribution levels and growth rates, and that would be looked at at a three, five, and 10-year projection of the, the levels and rates. Um, benefit uh, and funding benchmarks, options for providing uh, new benefit structures with the ob objective of adequate benefits within the established cost containment benchmarks. Uh, they would be looking at funding methods. Um, they would also be looking at an evaluation of a shared risk model for employee contributions and cost of living adjustments. Uh, and subdivision seven is a plan for pre-funding OPEB um, and evaluating any possible uh, uses of federal funds to the extent permissible. And then finally setting a pension stabilization target number. Subsection D requires that there's some stakeholder input in this process. So um, during the course of the, the deliberations and before any recommendations are made, the task force should solicit input, including through public hearings um, from the affected stakeholders. Subsection E lays out the assistance the committee would be getting. So administrative, technical, and legal assistance would come from the state treasurer's office. Uh, some fiscal assistance from the Joint Fiscal Office, and then finally, the Office of Legislative Operations would provide committee support services. So I just wanted to flag something here for folks because, um, you know, there are, in the, in the course of our conversations um, with folks who, uh, who are beneficiaries of the pension system, um, I recall, um, being very, uh, be very struck by the statement from the judiciary that they very much appreciated that we were inviting them in to talk about uh, reform to the pensions because they had never been <laughs> a part of the conversations before. Um, and so I just wanna flag that and also flag the fact that the Troopers Association isn't, it, while, while their um, benefit is, um, is lumped in with the VSEA as a whole. They do have their own separate um, uh, union. And, uh, and so I think it's worth having a conversation about the size of the task force and the ability of the task force to focus on each individual uh, part of this complex pension system. 
um, and whether it makes sense for there to be a seat, a specific seat at the table for the judiciary and the troopers, um, or whether we want to do some other sort of, um, you know, specifying that that they need to be involved in this process. I mean that this. Um, line 20 here on stakeholder input is really aimed at, uh, at, at giving a nod to those entities, um, but I think it's also worth having a conversation about whether, um, whether the task force should you know, include a seat at the table for them. So I'm just gonna lay that out there as a discussion point for the committee. Um, Peter Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks again, Becky. Um, this is where my uh, urging to, to think about the state employees in terms of groups comes up again, because obviously the judiciary is a group unto its own, as are the VSP. And so I, I just throw out that to the extent to which the uh, list of inquiries that Becky read uh, would be, um, how shall I say, uh, would turn up different evidence for different groups, it would be equally important to hear from those groups at least, if not also have them participate at some level. So I agree with you, Madam Chair. I, I'm not sure a seat at the table and trying to manage the total size of the tax force, the task force will have a certain tension to it. I understand that, uh, but there we are. Yeah, right. thank you. I mean, that's, that's the rub. If you look at the size of the the employee groups who are impacted by the work of the task force, you've got teachers, <laughs> you know, which is half of the half of the entity, but then within the state employees side, you've got, you know, group F, which spans the judiciary and state employees. Um, so, you know, we've got, we've got to figure out how to make this, uh, how to design this task force in a way that, um, that feels like it's got the right, uh, ability to function, but also the right perspectives at the table. If I may, a follow on, it's uh, entirely uh, possible and perhaps productive to have subcommittees uh, that essentially focus on particular and unique uh, patterns, issues, uh, circumstances, um, and that may help manage the overall size of the group and at the same time really put some emphasis on uniquely different subsets. Um, if I may, I, I also noticed that in the list uh, that Becky ticked off, I, I did not notice anybody representing uh, what used to be personnel human resources within the executive branch. I, maybe I missed it in when she was ticking that off, but it seems to me we had, uh, I had several questions I would have liked to ask to that person or that department, both informational and policy. Um, and we, we, you know, there was <laughs> sort of a lack of access, let me put it that way. Uh, and, and, and I think in the tax force, task force context, it would be very important to hear uh, about the challenges in retention, hiring, you know, all that rubric. Um, and yet I, I repeat, I didn't hear Becky actually uh, refer to that ingredient in the tax force membership. Thanks. Becky, you wanna, wanna point us to that? I think we're looking at page 18. Yeah, I think it's it's item E is the one that Representative Anthony is looking for. Yeah, yeah. so um, the one my the 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 Commissioner of Human Resources or designee. Yeah, Sorry, it's on, it's for some reason on my page seventeen, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um. So Peter, does that help you with uh, with your um, uh, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you, I agree with you in general, the more the merrier, particularly if it's uh, impacted employees as opposed to uh, 
I, I, Pat basically has said she was never invited, quite frankly. I don't think she's aware that members of her judicial judiciary branch are included in this now, but there's merit to having somebody from the Troopers Association and a judge uh, participate because they are standalone, even though they're in a, a, a plan structure that's involving more people in some cases. Um, the, I, I look at the number here and I say it's still pretty heavily slanted towards management. And I also go back again to the affected impacted groups, the NEA, the VSEA, uh, municipal board, if they happen to at some point get included, should be able to send anybody they want. If the speaker can send a representative sitting in the house, not entirely sure why we would tell the, one of the unions that they can't if they have that available. Happy to have a committee discussion about that. I think um, from my uh, from my view of it, it's helpful to know that you have people who are representing a viewpoint or an entity as opposed to people who are uh, wearing two hats. And if I might, one more, uh, what is the operational definition in D, 8D of affected stakeholders in the public hearing discussion? There is, there is no definition, um, so the committee can uh, be more explicit um, on if, if they have a stakeholder groups that they would like to explicitly name in the language, you could choose to do, this, do so. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could extrapolate that every person in the state of Vermont who pays taxes is a stakeholder. Which that's is why we're having this conversation right now. Pretty, that seems to be pretty broad. Thank you. It's true. And I think it's worth, um, it's worth just taking a moment to recognize that uh, the, the legislature um, has to write the check at the end of the day. And so, uh, so there should be uh, taxpayer involvement or understanding of what we're doing. Uh, John Gannon. Um, thank you. I, yeah, I just, I think there are multiple stakeholder groups that need to be represented. Um, and, and the public is one of them. Um, they, they have a, should have a say um, in how we manage our pensions um, because they're, they're paying the, the bill to some extent. So, I mean, I think that's important. And you look at some of the, the governance um, research out there that is one of the, the key stakeholders that should be included in decision-making. Um, and, and I do want to follow up, Bob keeps referring to management. Um, who, who on this task force, Bob, do you consider management? I think Bob has been transported out of his chair. <laughs> so, um, so let's, let's uh, yeah, okay. So repeat that question because Bob was somewhere else. Who, who on the task force is management, in your opinion? Uh, anybody that isn't uh, an employee beneficiary. Anybody? Well, right. that's, that's a pretty broad, broad question, and I have to give a pretty broad answer, but um, it, it's, it's going to be commingled, so I would probably back up a little bit and answer that question after consideration. That's not answering my question though. I mean, because you keep raising it, so you must have some concept uh, of what your concern is. Well, manage, in state government anyway, management is a designation um, and brings with it usually the political perspective of uh, the administration that they serve for. So, um, that to me has a tendency to say that there might be uh, an agenda beyond simply the fiduciary responsibility to the plan and its members. So that's sort of the perspective that I'd like to try to maintain. I may be using an imprecise word, John, but I think that's the sort of directive. Uh, 
But I'm trying to get to this. You say there's too much management. So I see, you know, management just based on your definition, you know, would be the commissioner of financial regulation, the commissioner of human resources. And you could argue a school board member would also be management, at least with respect to teachers. Could be, could, could be a, could be a teacher that's serving on the school board. Who knows? That's a, that's a variability. Uh, is there a, another position on this task force that you would consider management? Uh, I think that in, in terms of the way I look at this, John, it's, it's the impacted employee is sort of the person that I'd rather see at the table in proportion to the other side, quote unquote, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'm admittedly imprecise in defining that, but the more buy-in you have is generally a result of the more people who have an affinity to the class that is being affected or impacted. So can I just flag that as a as a point of committee discussion that I want us to come back to? Um, but I understand that Legislative Council has another committee waiting on her. So I'm hoping that we can uh, ask Peter to hold, unless Peter, yours is a specific question about words on the page. OK, so um, Peter, we'll come to you next after we let Becky uh, jog us through the rest of the bill so that we can at least understand the words on the page and then we can have committee discussion after. Uh, great. So uh, moving back to page 20 um, in terms of in assistance to the task force. Um, so subdivision two allows for the joint fiscal committee. Uh, it says it may provide benchmark targets, reducing the rate of expenditure growth for retirement and retiree health benefits to the task force. And this would help in guiding recommendations. So this is, um, you know, it's, it's discretionary. Um, it's not mandatory. Um, and then in subdivision three, the task force is given the authority to contra contract for some advisory services for uh, benefits expertise and legal expertise. And there's an amount of 200,000 in general funds appropriated for this purpose. Um, subsection F would uh, have the task force submitting a um, report by September 1st of this year, and that would go to the governor the GovOps committees um, and uh, any and would include any findings and recommendations for legislative action. And the report would also be provided to the two boards of the state employees and teachers system so they could comment on it uh, for the General Assembly. Um, in terms of meetings, um, the legislative members of the committee that the House and the Senate members would uh, choose co a House and Senate co-chair for the committee. And those co-chairs would uh, call the first meeting um, by July 15th. Uh, a majority would constitute a quorum and then the task force would cease to exist on June 30th of uh, next year. In terms of compensation, uh, both legislators and members who are not state employees would be compensated. Um, the legislative appropriations would come from uh, the legislative budget that the amount appropriated to the General Assembly and the uh, other members receiving compensation would, um, payments would be made for monies appropriated to the state treasurer. And then Any section 11 is the effective date, so it would take effect on passage. Any questions for Becky about the meaning of the words on the page? Um, I think we can have a committee discussion about the policy decisions after we let her go to her next committee meeting. All right. Thank you so much, Becky, for Thank being you. with us this morning. And um, we look forward to working with you again on this okay. soon. OK, great. Thank you. All right, uh, we had uh, a, a conversation ongoing that I interrupted about uh, the balance between um, management and non-management uh, and work and impl affected employees on the task force. So uh, Peter, is that what your hand was on? Yeah, yes, um, 
I, I, I'm not sure, John, I can improve. Um, but for me, uh, it's, a, it's a topic of balance that I tried to introduce a couple of times along the way here. And it does have to do with skin in the game, legitimacy, rather than hard uh, hierarchical kinds of titles like management, employer, representative. Uh, I, I, I don't know that that helps the conversation, but, and it admittedly is squishy. And I apologize for that, but but I I, I don't see uh, I don't see uh, lifting personnel titles uh, and trying to transpose that into uh, something like perspective is is necessarily um, informative. Um, so I go back to do people have faith in the independent judgment of that person or that position? John Gannon. So a couple of things. Uh, one, there is, as Bob has defined it, there's only two members of management on this task force, and that's the Commissioner of Financial Regulation, and the Commissioner of Human Resources. There are, four un there are four union members on there. So the balance seems to weigh, with respect to that, in, in, in the direction of union. As far as the legislative members go, we, we indicate in this language that they had to be independent um, that's one of the things we're focused on is that they're, they're not getting a pension from the state, um, that they're independent. Um, and that was a focus there so that they will be an independent voice with respect to how this task force moves forward. And there's six of them that will have no skin in the game. And, and I think, and, you know, we'll represent both parties or, or all three parties. So I'm just trying to get to the concern that there's too much management on this task force because frankly, I don't see it. Mike McCarthy. I wanna take a step back. I, I agree generally with Representative Gannon's perspective, but um, Madam Chair, you said something that really caught my ear early in this conversation, which was you know, about us bringing people to the table um, with this task force in order to make a recommendation. Like what is, what are we actually asking this task force to do? And you know, we heard from folks at the public hearings, we heard folks in uh, testimony here in committee that talked about the need for more work to be done to make sure that any changes to plans, any recommendations to how the plans um, would, would change, the promises that we're making employees would still work as a recruitment tool, all of those things um, that we would have the time. And this task force, they don't get to make the decision, they get to make a recommendation. And then that's on us when we return next year to accept their recommendations or make changes, you know, we need, that's us. And um, I think we want to make sure that there's the full span of voices um, at the table with the task force, but at the, in the, in the end, you know, we're convening folks to do that work, come up with the best recommendation they can, and then give us that to work on. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I have a couple questions and a couple concerns about what I'm perceiving the timeline to be here. So if, if I read this correctly, we're, the, the task force isn't going to meet before July 15th of, 20, of, of 2021. Is that, so we're not anticipating them meeting before then. And then we are looking for them to have a report back to the governor and the House and Senate committees and governor operations by September 1st. So basically two months, is that, am I reading that correctly? Uh, that is what the words on the page say, but we can certainly have a, a discussion about that. Um, okay. Speaking as one, you know, legislator, but also talking with a lot of other legislators who uh, who are a little bit on overload with the Zoom pace of the world. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that House and Senate members would have much capacity to start participating in this until adjournment. But I'm happy to talk about um, yeah bumping up that timeline. Well, I, I you know I think I said the other day I'd like to have this group get together much sooner than later. Um, in a perfect world, I'd like to have some sort of an agreement by the end of this fiscal year, recognizing that may be optimistic, but I would remind this esteemed group here that these pensions were accruing debt 
to the tune of millions and millions of dollars a month. And the longer this continues to go on, um, the deeper the hole we have to dig ourselves out of. And that could potentially mean um, a lot more effort on all parties' sides involved later on. That's, that's primarily my concern is, is the timeline. Yeah, and I guess I, I want to, I want to honor what I heard people saying in our public hearings as well, and in particular the teachers that I talked to, that, um, that their capacity to engage in this um, is impacted for, on the teacher side by the fact that they're in the middle of a school year. Um, so I feel like we've got a we've got to weigh the urgency with the ability of some of those employee groups to, um, you know, to, to, to come to the table and start engaging in this. Um, I guess I would say that those that have been involved in contract negotiations that happens during the school year consistently. Yeah. There's a special kind of pressure though, during COVID with, um, with what's going on in our schools at this moment, but uh, that's, anyway. That's fair. Leave it open as a discussion point. Um, Sam Lefebvre, are you on this or are you back to the question of balance? I, sorry, I was on this as in, um, I, I too feel that something to start sooner than later with the respect, I understand that both legislators and teachers are under you know, the being on Zoom all the time and the pressures that they are under with COVID. But I just feel that we're not being good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars if we, we know that we are losing that much money a month. Even if we were to dump the money that we were said that we were going to, we're still going to end up with more unfunded liability. So to me, the sooner we start looking at this, um, the, the more appropriate, you know, I feel that we'd be doing our job. Thanks. Um, Peter Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, my sense of the, the plea at the hearings that I heard was in reference to a task force for this summer, not the summer of 2021. Um, and I guess I would also say, uh, I'm, I'm not, never having lived through a reapportionment session, I can't appreciate it, but I, I just think because that's set back a ways. If this task force had something to plunk on the table the second week of January um, in 2021, I, I dare say we could deal with it or we'll never deal with it. Uh, I, I, I'm optimistic that this uh, pressure cooker that we have just lived through uh, uh, is fresh in everybody's mind. They understand uh, that time is real money and it's gonna squeeze the general fund the longer we wait. I would also suggest in, in, um, in response to uh, Rep McCarthy's uh, observation of what are we actually asking, let me just throw on the table, uh, just as the last task for, force picked a particular glide path and date, what we could do is say, we want you to recalculate an amortization path uh, that is 20 years out from the date the, uh, the legislature uh, enacts the recommendations. And I would say, call it 2042 and literally do the recalculation based on that target and uh, based on new actuarial assumptions, uh, whatever changes the task force recommends that are in fact enacted uh, and see where we are. Thanks. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think, you know, back to John's question, what I'm looking at is uh, the fact that there are so few uh, actual representatives of a particular class. And I'll think about that more and get back in our next meeting, maybe. Um, I, I'm also concerned, even from the start, I wanted to make this conversation a point. Uh, if we throw OPEB into this, which it shouldn't be, I continue to maintain because it's not a retirement obligation. Uh, it only makes the water murkier. And 
I particularly note that 2A on the back of my page 20, which I think might be your page 19, excludes uh, people who are beneficiaries of the system. And I would suggest that there's a good possibility that the director, the commissioner, or the commissioner, uh, a couple of them having come up through the ranks, fit into that also. So I don't really see when you talk about people exercising a fiduciary responsibility where that should weigh too heavily. And it's very paternalistic, as I said earlier, for the uh, other limitations on restricting the employees groups from doing what they think is the best for their fund. Thank you. Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple of pieces and and so my understanding would be that if we were to if we were to invest the money that now that it would gain interest and could potentially actually decrease the liability so we could essentially buy ourselves the couple of months to all you know relax after a covid school year and a covid legislative session and and sort of come back to the table with fresh heads so i think that's certainly something to keep in mind and then Going back to the members of the task force, the what I mean, there I, I think there's lots of committee conversation here, and I'm I'm certainly happy to wait for a more in-depth conversation. But I am curious specifically about um, the member from the business community and and why why we're thinking they need to be here. Um. That I think was just sort of in recognition that maybe a fresh perspective that the speaker might appoint to this uh, task force who's not immersed in um, in all of the discussions that we've been having um, and could perhaps just be sort of a, I don't know, a voice for the taxpayer of Vermont. Um, I guess the details of how we how, how you define that would, you know, are certainly uh, up for conversation here. Um, but, you know, it sometimes it helps to have just that little bit of fresh perspective, somebody who's not already, um, you know, hasn't already sort of determined what they think the right answer is. Uh, Happy to, happy to have that as a discussion point. Uh, Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't recall who from the committee suggested it, but for the task force, um, could we consider how much it would cost and who the right person would be to have someone that was not involved at all? Um, and I don't think the business person would be the right person, but to help um, not moderate the conversation but to make sure that the, the that the task force is moving how they are supposed to be someone that is neutral completely removed from it um because uh, my feeling is even you know like we are we are doing very well but there's 11 of us and we know we have deadlines to meet um but when you get a group even larger and there will be a lot of emotions um going into that as well that it'd be helpful to have someone that's completely neutral completely out of all of it to help make sure that they are working and uh working forward not that they wouldn't on their own but sometimes it just helps to have a a meeting point of um like get it all out we need to get moving here um it, could we possibly look into that or i mean maybe someone even would volunteer for the benefit of the state of vermont just to be that person who knows um but could we maybe potentially think about that interesting i i'm glad that you brought that up and thank you for reminding me because i think i've heard that idea floated before um the idea of having some sort of a facilitator who uh who can guide um so yeah, certainly happy to um, happy to look into that, and would love to um, you know would love to hear people's ideas about uh, you know about the kind of facilitator we might be that uh, we might think would do a good job with that. Uh, Mike Marwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to weigh in myself on this idea of uh, 
defining a quote unquote businessman or business person. Um, I have a, a good friend who took me to school on that. Um, he, he used to teach at Dartmouth and started a business based on his research into photonics, which I can't tell you what he does. Uh, but in many of our discussions, I will rise up and talk about business community this and that. He keeps reminding me, I'm a business person, he says. And this is somebody politically who's way to the left of me. So I think when we start trying to define what a business person means to be on this, uh, Bernie Sanders is a business person. He wrote a book. He made money on it. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be careful when I say that. Peter Anthony. I just, uh, to, to refund my, my good friend, Mariki, uh, you, could, you could invite a member. I, by the way, I agree about the facilitator thing. I think that would be val very valuable. And thank you, Sam, for reminding me of that. But on the business, uh, I, I think given the amount of uh, both emotional commitment and cultural uh, iconog iconography, <laughs> iconography that we place on small businesses here, we ought to just say, let v VSBR um, uh, send a, a rep uh, who is a small business person, um, it, you know, let them participate as a sort of... Uh, reality check, if you will, uh, for the task force. Um, that, would, that would confine, so to say, the eligibility somewhat in terms of indigenousness and perspective, uh, I think. Um, so I just throw that out as a way to further hone in what does it mean to appoint a business person? Thanks. Hmm. Mike Berwicki. No, you're done. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wholly agree with what uh, Peter just said. I, I envision this being an access point for the business roundtable to come in and yet again give us their agenda. And uh, quite frankly, they have an agenda. I don't think they're balanced. Uh, I don't notice specifically an actuary being designated uh, like in item C3 or 3 and I think it's important that that be available because quite frankly, when you stock, start talking about benefit changes, uh, you don't go anywhere without one of those. And I don't think that anybody in the state capital has the ability to do that kind of number running. Uh, and that's just sort of a, an area that I think we should specifically address. Uh, as you I'm said, one point, Madam Chair, they're expensive and $200,000 should cover it, but who knows? Um, thank you. Yeah, that is what is intended in um, in three on line 10 of page 20, um, contract for advisory services from independent benefits expert and legal expert as necessary. So uh, happy to hear uh, opinions from folks who have a sense of how much it's gonna to cost to do this work. Um, 200,000 was suggested, so that is a starting place here. Um, Tanya Vihosky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two things, I wanna clarify that I'm not saying that it should be a ban on someone who happens to be a business owner from, I'm just curious as to why they have an earmarked spot. So I just, I I'm the, I own a private practice technically that makes me a business owner. I certainly get Absolutely. that they have that. So I certainly didn't, I wanna clarify, I'm not saying that anyone who owns a business cannot sit on the committee, um, but that is, you know, I think we can have deeper discussion about that. The other thing I'm curious about in this bill, and I know that I've sort of brought this up a lot is if there has been any additional exploration about including that full spectrum audit that I've talked about to sort of inform the, the movement forward. Um, and I'm certainly happy to reach back out to the, the treasurer, or not the treasurer, the auditor's office if need be, but I do want to sort of earmark that as, as something for further discussion as we move forward. Yep. Um, and I think the question that I asked when that idea first came up is, do we have a do we have a number of what that costs um, from, you know, from the auditor's perspective, if we ask the auditor to contract with somebody to do an evaluation? 
I will reach out to Doug to see if he can give us that number. That would be super. Um, other observations, questions, suggestions? Clarification? Yes. What I, I missed, I think, the, the end of the comment on adding a judge or a trooper to the mix. Did we go past that and I missed it or did we just go past it? I flagged that when we went through the membership of the task force and we spoke briefly, I think, about whether it made sense to designate subcommittees if we wanted to get into that much nuance about how the task force is going to do its work and its consideration. So um, we can flag that and we can hear what people think over the course of the next few days in committee. Thank you. Gannon, John. John, you need we can't yeah. hear you. <laughs> uh, another way to possibly address Bob's concerns is to identify specifically which stakeholders we need to reach out to. Um, you know, right now it just says reach out to stakeholders. So we could be more specific there. Um, you know, one of the concerns I have is if you start adding too many people to this task force, um, it will become very unwieldy, especially given the short time frame it has to work in. You know, if you had 30 members trying to schedule meetings um, that most of those people could participate in in a short period of time, I think would be extremely difficult. Yeah, and I would love to find a way to um, to direct this task force um, that they must uh, sit down with certain um, uh, certain interested parties and um, and see if we can get some sort of consensus around that um, as opposed to expanding the task force too much larger. But again, we'll, we'll continue to hear testimony about that. This is really just a first pass of committee identifying um, areas to come back to. Hal? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I agree. Um, I think the more specificity around who those stakeholders might be, it's, it's for me pretty similar to when we get into conversations about protective classes, we, the more specific, the better, because um, we just otherwise um, may overlook people that need to be at the table. Good point. All right, um, other committee discussion on the words in front of us. All right. Uh, Sam Lefebvre. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, to me, um, about like the troopers and the judiciary, like those people came to testify to us when we had the uh, open, when we had the public hearing um, and they've written us letters and they've expressed. So to me, it would be no question that they should be at the table. I understand growing bigger, you have more, you have more problems, but if we're, if they are being affected, then they should be at the table if that's what this task force is set to do. And I understand that we're looking at it, I apologize, I understand that we're looking at it, you know, how to represent them best, but if we are affecting them, we are doing the task force, then they should be at the table because I thought that was the whole reasoning behind having this task force. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I guess, uh, you know, my thought is, um, you know, if the task force is focused on something with respect to the to the teachers plan, um, is it, you know, is that something that we need to have each of the, um, you know, each of the state employees side, whether it's troopers or judiciary or uh, VSEA folks um, involved in that and, and, you know, if they want to they want to commit the time to it and and we want to expand the task force we can certainly do that but um just trying to be respectful of uh people's time as well isn't this more than just the teacher's plan oh it did is. i mishear you no no okay it, okay. it is Sorry. it is it Sorry. is both teachers and state employees and I, I i'm just suggesting that since a big focus is going to need to be on half of the problem with half of the problem being the teacher's retirement system, um, you know, do all those folks wanna, uh, wanna stay and participate in that half of it? 
So other questions, comments, suggestions um, before we wrap? Okay, so um, committee, what I would like to do since we have um, a little more time this morning, um, what I'd like to do is ask folks to uh, to take the rest of the morning um, and uh, and into your lunch hour if you want to, and dig into some of the issues that you uh, that you may have raised as we were having committee discussion here, um, and bring back you know resources, bring back sample reports, bring back a model for how uh, you know how this is done in other states. Um, uh, if you have some thoughts on, you know, on the type of facilitation that we might like um, to suggest, uh, you know, certainly do some research on that as well. Um, and we will take the rest of the morning um, to work independently or grab a, a colleague on the committee and, um, and work on a project together. And we are scheduled to come back to committee after the floor this afternoon. And I hope that Rob LeClaire has an accurate crystal ball and that we're not gonna be on the floor for, I don't know, was it four, four hours yesterday, six hours? I don't know, it, it felt really long. <laughs> um, it is what it is. Uh, Sam Lefebvre. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. May I just throw a, a idea out that if hearing what you said, so, like, so we, we understand that there's the state employees and the, the teachers, and we understand that the, put, put the legislate, put the legislatures that would be on there aside, because I feel like we do have a responsibility and people might just need to, you know, only be considered to be appointed if they feel like they're not overloaded. Um, that's a responsibility, be, you know, between them and the speaker, but could the state employees task force have like a mini breakout and they start working and then the teachers, when they feel that they, are done for the year, they can start working and then everybody comes together because, you know, what would a state trooper, uh, you know, I did not, not that they wouldn't know, but like, you know, they, they care about their side and the teachers care about their side, but we know we need to get to a bigger idea. So even just get the ball rolling to maybe even weed out some of the things where like, hey, like we tried this, it doesn't really work. So we're going to move on from that. But just to get them working earlier than July, because um, I know that was one of uh, Rep. Leclerc's biggest concerns is, you know, and mine too, like if if I would have had people ready, like I would have Friday night, I would have started working uh, just, to, just to have people get going. Um, to me, it, it's important. So could that uh, people just maybe ponder, think about that, you know, get one side moving and at the end, you know, everybody needs to sit at the table. Everybody needs to be comfortable um, with this, but uh, maybe just get the state side going until the teachers uh, have their deserved break from school and then move move into working on their end. And then again, follow the deadlines um, that we have in place, but potentially we could get some help uh, started earlier. So um, yeah, that sounds a little bit like the subcommittee model that um, that maybe Peter said earlier, I can't remember who said that, um, you know, the idea that that working working in focused groups might be beneficial. So um, let's flag that as an idea. Um, and we will certainly put ideas and other perspectives um, on the table as people come and ask to testify in committee. All right, so um, have a productive rest of your morning. Um, maybe you'll find some reading material that you can continue browsing during floor debate, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, I believe that that is all we need to cover for this morning. So thank you for your focus and attention.